Okay, guys, this is our final section here. We're going to talk about axis deviation real quick. EKGs goes a far beyond what this last part is. I mean, we could go into hemi blocks and fascicular blocks and whatever, but I gather this is just an intro course. This is just an intro uh, part for you guys to learn the basics of EKG, what do wave deflections mean. And I think if you can figure out just the foundation of this stuff, then it becomes extraordinarily easy just to just to add in little pieces of information. Oh, this is AFib. Oh, this is a flutter. What do we do here, here, and here? And um, you can easily add that information in. I think the hardest part is actually just getting a good, strong foundation. And so um, this is what my aim was to do with this. So we're going to talk about axis deviation. We know that this green line right here is the mean axis deviation. It's the way that most of the electricity is flowing through the heart. Remember, the heart kind of sits cattywampus in your head heart and a little rotated so that the axis deviation is actually a little more towards your kind of left hip area and if we were to draw a, a hexagonal um, reference plane here and divide it into quadrants okay and this is zero degrees and then going counterclockwise this is 90 degrees this is 180 degrees this is 270 degrees Okay, and so that green line, if you were to just kind of transplant it over onto the this grid that we've created, is kind of going in this direction, okay? And that is the normal axis of the way things should go. Now, in fact, that is actually about 60 degrees. Now, what we need to do is we need to take all these leads that we've drawn and put them on the grid so that we can, if we had an EKG that had axis deviation, it would be easy to discover uh, what actually is that, uh, what is the axis deviation that we're seeing. So I'm going to kind of erase this green line a little bit so we have more room to work with. There you go. All right, so let's just start putting our leads back on the the um, grid. And what we're going to do is simply transplant exactly the way it's oriented on this person and put it on the grid like that. So for, this is the tail and this is the head of lead one. And we're going to move it straight over here and put it at zero. So that would be lead one. Okay. Do the same thing with lead two. Okay, so exactly the way it looks. All right, so put the tail in the center, and then, see, does that look familiar? Okay, so that's lead two. And that is lead, that's why lead two is often used as the uh, default lead to be um, monitoring uh, EKGs because uh, it fits the mean electrical axis. Lead three, if we were to transplant it onto the grid exactly the way it looks, then it would end up with the tail here and then the head coming out here. And that's lead three. Okay. And then if we were to do the augmented voltage leads, then we would simply take them the way they look. So this is the tail of and the head of AVL. And it would come up like this. Okay. And then AVF would come straight down, AVF, and then uh, AVR would come out here. Okay, so now we've basically taken all our leads and st and put them on this axis so that we can use information gleaned from the um, EKG itself to figure out what truly is the patient's axis. Um, so we said that anything between 0 and 90 is uh, considered normal, okay? So this would, I'm going to write normal right here, okay? I should probably pick another color here. Um, so that means that lead 1 and lead AVF would give us the best idea of whether the the patient's true axis fit within this 0 to 90 range, okay? So for the sake of argument, let's say that I'm going to erase part of his body here. So let's say that we were looking at lead one, lead one, and lead AVF. Okay. 
and we did yeah, we're just looking at QRSs, okay? We don't care about P waves. Even though P waves and T waves have their own um, axis, we really only care about the, the QRS in this case. Okay, and never mind that they're all the, kind of the same height. I just did that because I'm drawing. All right, so what would happen if this was a positive here and a positive here? Well, in real life, what you would do or what the machine is doing is it is measuring from the base of this QRS to the, t the peak of the R, so, the, so where it has the early takeoff to the QRS, on the top of the R wave, sorry, and it is taking that, and this is lead one, so it must be going towards the, the positive pole, like we said, because it's all upward deflections, and it's just writing it right here, okay, so whatever, however much that distance was, it just writes it right here. Okay, and then it looks at AVF as well, and it measures it from here to here. Upward deflection must be going towards AVF, so we draw it here to here. Now you take perpendicular lines and draw your straight edge, and it goes off to here, and then it goes off out to here. And so then you go to the epicenter and try to go through those cross perpendicular lines. I don't know if I can do this on this computer, but it seems that the axis goes in this direction, and that's how the computer is figuring it out. All right, so let me give you another one just real quick, and we will do it. I'm going to erase what we did. All right, and I will do this one in a blue color. All right, so now we have a P... I always do that. All right, we have a P wave, a QRS, but this time, let's say the... QRS down here is in the negative deflection, okay? All right, once again, the computer is going to measure when it begins its R ascent and then top of the R wave, and it's going positive in the R, in the one, lead one direction, so it would again be in this kind of straight line here, but AVF, it is going, is measuring from here to here, but it's going in the opposite direction because we know electricity is flowing away from AVF because there's a negative deflection of the QRS. So we must go opposite AVF, and that means that we would be going up this way. Okay. Now, again, draw your perpendicular lines like you know you're supposed to, and then you draw an axis out like that. So when this happens, this lets us know that the, the mean electrical axis is actually kind of rotated up, and it's more of a leftward axis deviation because most of the electricity is spending its time going along this vector based on the leads that we calculated. Now, this can happen for several reasons, and I'll tell you the reasons at the end, but this in this quadrant is left axis deviation, okay? Now, uh, let's just keep giving scenarios here. So um, I'm going to cut these out, and I'm going to fill it in again. Let's say we put, um, we put negative deflection here and a positive deflection here, okay? So we'll measure from here to here on one. Okay, that's going away from lead one, right, because it's a negative deflection, so we must go this way with it, and however long that distance is, we've drawn it here, and we do the same thing with AVF, and it's going towards AVF, so that's because that's a positive deflection, so we do this towards AVF, draw the dotted lines, and then an epicenter through the intersection, okay? And that means if you found a negative deflection of QRS in lead one and a positive deflection of a in AVF, you would know that you are in a right axis deviation because the electrical activity has spent most of its time swung the wrong way. It's swung this way, okay? And that can happen for a variety of reasons, which we'll discuss in just a second. And then the only other permutation that we haven't discussed yet is what happens when both QRSs are in the negative deflection. Sorry, that's a terrible QRS. So we know that the one would be negative, but we also know that AVF has now got to be negative, so we would draw it and draw our perpendicular lines 
and draw it, and so we'd be over here. So this is known as extreme right axis deviation, and it's not supposed to happen because then that means your mean electrical axis is not is just not it's not going just to the right; it's going almost in reverse. And if you were to have extreme right axis deviation, that means that everything in ABR would be in the upward deflection, which doesn't happen because normally the mean electrical axis is supposed to flow away from ABR. All right, so that's how the computer is figuring out what your axis deviation is. The quick and dirty way of figuring that out is if you were to just put your thumbs up, so your right and your left hand, thumbs up, and so if you had a positive deflection in, a in one and a positive deflection in ABF, this looks like two thumbs are up, and so that would indicate that this is normal, okay? Then there's two ways to do this, and I'm going to show you both ways. If you had a negative deflection, let's change colors just so you can keep track of it. Let's say you had a positive deflection in um, uh, one and a negative deflection in ABF. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to consider your left hand to be characteristic of one and then your right hand characteristic of AVF and you just make your thumbs point the direction that you find the QRS is in. So in the first example one was up and AVF is up, both are up, that means that's good. Okay, It's in the normal quadrant. In the blue one, if, a, if one is up and AVF is pointed down, now look at your hands. Which hand has got the thumbs up? And it would be your left side, which means that is left axis deviation. So you have an up and a down. Okay. Some people say that looks like a boat or a canoe. Okay. And it's everybody has a pleasurable time when you're on a boat. Okay. So, so because and the reason I say that is because left axis deviation can be okay, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's why it's a, it's not so terrible. Uh, let's do another one where you have. Um, what if you had a negative uh, deflection in one and you had a positive deflection in AVF? Okay, assign your hands again. Your left hand is lead one and your right hand is AVF. So now in lead one, your left hand has to point down and your right hand points up. Okay, which hand has a thumbs up? That would be right hand, so that means it's right axis deviation. Okay. Um, that looks like angry teeth. So as we've crossed the 90 mark, that looks like we're getting worse. Okay, that's not a good thing. All right, because now what you're saying is the mean electrical axis is spending most of its time away from the left ventricle. Okay, and we need to know why that is. That's not a good idea. All right, and then the last uh, possible scenario would be if they're both down. Okay, so they're just having a bad day. So both thumbs would be down. And that would indicate that you're in extreme right axis deviation. And you can make sense of that because positive, positive, which was the normal, the opposite of that is terrible, which is negative, negative. Okay, so that's just a quick kind of and dirty way. Sometimes you're not carrying calipers around with you and you don't know and you got a patient dying in front of you. It's not time to be just measuring all these little square boxes and you really don't trust where that little EKG machine's telling you. So it's just a quick and dirty way to go, oh, just look at one AVF real quick. Oh, that looks like a boat. That's left axis deviation. Move forward. Now, what does this mean to you? Okay, so uh, the mean electrical axis will always go towards hypertrophy and blocks and the reason is is if you have a bigger heart muscle then it takes more time to depolarize that whole heart muscle if you've got blocks if you got somebody blocking up the road then I gotta take more time to get around it in order to get from A to B so I spend most of my time wherever these two things are the axis drifts away from death meaning infarction, because dead myocardial cells don't conduct electricity. So if I had a left axis deviation, that would tell me I could have three choices. I could have left ventricular hypertrophy, I could have a left bundle branch block, or I could be having a right-sided MI. And you would know that because you know that right-sided MIs are in leads 2, 3, and AVF. Okay, so you take the lesson that you learned from the previous lecture and you apply it here and you've got just another tool to help you figure out what's going on with the heart. Now, the reason I said that there, 
uh, there is a small margin of error for the left vid, uh, left axis deviation, and it's about 30 degrees. Okay, and at 30 degrees is what's known as physiologic left axis deviation. So I'm going to color it in here. Physiologic left axis deviation means it's okay for it to be a little bit past zero over here. What we're concerned about is when you're way over here in the left side, and greater than 30, somewhere between 30 and negative 90. All right, so what can cause this? Well, let's say you're a nine-month pregnant person, and you have a gravid uterus that's pushing up on all your chest cavity, and so even though your heart is still tilted and rotated a little bit normally, now you've got a uterus that's turning your whole heart more in a horizontal fashion. Well, you didn't take that into account when you put the stickers on the person, and so now the stickers make it look like she's got a big old left axis deviation, even though her axis her axis is normal. It's just that her heart is turned more more horizontal in her chest because her uterus is pushing up on it. So that's okay. Same thing with obesity. If you had a ton of uh, belly fat that was just pushing up on your uh, heart, then you would get a little axis deviation up there, and it's okay. What we're concerned about is things like hypertrophy and blocks, and you, we would have to have a whole other little seminar on whether it's hypertrophy or whether it's a block and how to tell that. But um, We'll save that for another day. Now, reverse it. What if you were tall and skinny, like you had Marfan syndrome? So now you have all this stuff that's pulling your heart in a more vertical direction. Well, once again, you've put the um, EKG leads on in a normal fashion, but they are reading that makes it look like the mean electrical axis is swung around to the right, and all that's really happened is that your heart hangs more vertically in your chest because you know from anatomy that your heart is actually connected to your diaphragm. So if, if your organs are pulled more down vertically, it was also going to rotate your heart a little bit in the clockwise direction. Um, so that would give you kind of a right axis deviation. So you have to just, you can't use this in, in isolation. You have to look at this, plus isolate any kind of MI, look at rhythm, rate, ischemia, hypertrophy, blocks. There are 15 things you need to look at an EKG, and this is just one of them, and it's imperative that you understand how to do this because you don't have time to be sitting here drawing all these pictures when the patient's dying in front of you. Okay, so it takes plenty of practice. So if we look at our EKG that we've been looking at, if you look at 1 and AVF, you can see that both those are elevated. I mean, they're not elevated, but they've got a positive deflection, which would tell you those are two thumbs up, which means that this axis is normal. So just as a quick run-through, I can see that all these EKG leads have a, a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave. The P wave, or the PRI, is less than three to five small boxes, and the QRS is less than three small boxes, which means they're all normal shape. AVR has a low, as, as a negative deflection, which is what I would expect. You have a 1 and AVF that has got a positive deflection, both of them, meaning it's got a good axis, and you can see that there's biphasic QRS in, in V3, which is where I would expect it, meaning there is a good R wave progression in V5, uh, V1 through V6. I see no ST elevation in, or ST depression in my limb leads or my, um, my precordial leads. And so that's as far as we've learned up to this point. And, you know, just from me looking at this, I don't see anything wrong with this. And in fact, this is a normal EKG because there are no conduction abnormalities, no blocks, uh, no hypertrophy or anything like that. So I hope this lecture series has helped you. If you would like me to talk about hypertrophy and blocks and things like that, I'd be glad to help you out in that regard. Um, I just posted these to give you just a nice strong baseline. You need to go back and look at all these lectures lectures and try to reproduce these pictures but know why you're drawing all these things to so that you can actually um, account, encounter any problem you may see with the EKG and immediately know um, what, it, what it means so you don't have to waste time doing all this uh, mental gymnastics and so forth. Okay, so I hope this helped and I will see you next time.